Thank you. I was sent here today to make uh, Pastor Tim look good. You'll, you'll want him back. <laughs> you know, sometimes we don't know what to do. In situations and circumstances that seem bigger than we are. But we have a wonderful thing, the word of the Lord that he gives us and his spirit that we don't have to worry about what we face, but we do have to worry about hearing his voice and being obedient to that voice. And today we're gonna to take a, a little look at some of the requirements that God places upon us as his sons and daughters, as believers in Jesus Christ. Some of the things are wonderful and we all love the promises, but there's also challenges in his word of God to rise to what he has created us to be in Christ Jesus. Proverbs 28, verse 1, and Clay was nice enough, he has those on, on the side TVs there. It says that the wicked run away when no one is chasing them, but the godly are as bold as lions. God has called us to be bold for his kingdom, to speak of this gospel that we've come to know and to proclaim it. And by his spirit, he promises that we can have that boldness, that even in the face of opposition, that we don't have to stand down. I want to open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. This powerful word, the word of truth. Your word that comes to us and illuminates the things that are dark and deceptive in our hearts and our minds. And that we see in this world, Father. I pray that your truth would hit our hearts, Lord, as we read your word. That you would give us understanding by your spirit. Lord, that these things would become a part of who we are. That we would accept the challenge that you've put before us. And we would also accept the challenge that the world has presented to us. That, Lord, we can stand in the victory that you've already won for us. And we have to just simply follow you as you called out to each one of your disciples. Come, follow me. So, Father, as we look into your word today, I pray, Lord, you would stir our hearts to want to follow you as closely as we can. And be the influence that you call us to be in this world. And we thank you for your truth. In Jesus' name. There's a word uh, in the Hebrew, it's called botox, not botox. Botox might lift your face, but this word, it will lift your confidence. It means to trust, to rely, and to have confidence. What can cause you to lose that confidence and that boldness that God wants us to have? We're going to look into that today a little bit. We're, I have a little bit of a pre-story till we get to the actual story because I think it's good to know the groundwork that was laid to, that brought the people to this place and the people that God used. Revelation 21, five through eight, it says that he who sits on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, right, for, these words are faithful and true. They are accurate, incorruptible, and trustworthy. This is from the Amplified version. Verse six, and he said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. To the one who thirsts, I will give water from the fountain of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes the world by hearing faithfully to Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior will inherit these things. And I will be his God and he will be my son. And then the challenge comes, verse 8. But as for the cowards and the unbelieving and abominable who are devoid of character and personal integrity and practice or tolerate immorality and murderers and sorcerers with intoxicating drugs and idolaters and occultists who practice and teach false religion and all the liars who knowingly deceive and twist the truth. Their part is in the lake that blazes with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So there's a challenge to us as believers. It's hard to believe that you would group a coward in with the Im immoral, with liars. But he groups that in that category. Yep. There's something about his truth that we have to come to believe and grasp. Because if you walk in that truth, your life is going to demonstrate that. Jesus said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the only way to have the life that God has designed for us is to walk in that truth that he's given us of Jesus Christ and the things of his kingdom. Yep. And the whole world is set up against that. When 
Jesus was here, um, you know, the ones that didn't want to hear his words and believe his words, they were of the world. They didn't, they didn't want to hear truth. They had their own truth. We're hearing that a lot today, right? Be, be your own truth. You decide what is right, what is wrong. What's good for you is good for you, and that's fine. You walk in that. That's not the truth. That is a lie, and it's twisted. And we're going to look at that today, what that did to a man and his calling and his anointing that God had given him. We must guard our hearts and continue in obedience to Jesus. We can easily disregard his commands and take them as requests if we're not completely trusting in him and his plans. And we must stay mindful to whom we follow. When the Israelites stood before the mountain and, and the presence of God came to the mountain and the mountain shook and there was lightnings and thunderings, they got fearful and they said to Moses, you go. You go talk to this God and we'll do whatever you tell us. You know it's easier to disobey a man than it is God. So they were happy to have a man speak for them because then they could just say, we'll just disregard you. But when they seen the power in the presence of Almighty God, it brought a reverent fear to their heart. They didn't want to have to face that. But we can be in the presence of God because of what Jesus has done in us. It can be a sudden move from faith to fear, but there are usually many steps that lead to that suddenly moment. It's, uh, there was a song out years ago, a uh, contemporary song, It's a Slow Fade. It doesn't happen in one moment. The enemy is pretty sneaky how he works to get us away from obedience to the Lord. And says, we'll look at a life of a man who was anointed, appointed of God, and then lost his anointing, and he ended up pretty disappointed. He went from being a conqueror to a coward. Whether it be a man, a nation, doesn't matter. Disobedience will bring loss and death. There's no two ways about that. Don't be deceived thinking that you can disobey a word from the Lord and you're going to end up on the good side of things. It doesn't happen that way. There's more to the story than what you can imagine at first glance. So we're going to lay out about a little bit of the groundwork. How, how did the nation get there? And when they got there, what did they choose to do? And it really wasn't what God wanted to do. But he listened to them, and we'll see how this all unfolds. And we're going to talk about a man named Saul here then eventually. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 through 10. And this is also taken from the New Living Testament then. As Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons to be judges over Israel. Joel and Abijah, his oldest sons, held court in Beersheba. And they were not like their father, for they were greedy for money. They accepted bribes and perverted justice. Finally, all the elders of Israel met at Ramah to discuss the matter with Samuel. Look, they told him, you are now old and your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. Samuel was displeased with their request and went to the Lord for guidance. Do everything they say to you, the Lord replied, for it is me they are rejecting, not you. They don't want me to be their king any longer. Ever since I brought them from Egypt, they have continually abandoned me and followed other gods. And now they are giving you the same treatment. Do as they ask, but solemnly warn them about the way a king will reign over them. So Samuel passed when the Lord's warning to the people who were asking him for a king. You know, God's heart was, he wanted to be their king. He wanted to be their ruler. He wanted to lead them. He wanted to use them as a powerful nation to demonstrate his power and his presence in this earth. But they didn't want to do that. And in their disobedience and their disregard for God, they, they got off course. And they asked for a king. They want to be like other nations. You know, it's hard sometimes to stand as a Christian. You're, you're called out. You're called out of the world. Yes, we're in it, but we're not of it. And it can be uncomfortable at times when you don't participate with the things in the world. And they can mock you. And they can set you out of the day-to-day -day things of life even. It can cost you careers. It can cost you family. Mm -hmm. Because he said that it would come and it would divide even families, yeah. this truth. Because there's those that will receive it and those that won't. And in verse Samuel 10, Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it over Saul's head. He kissed Saul and said, I am doing this because the Lord has appointed you to be the ruler over Israel, his special possession. And then we jump down to 1 Samuel uh, 8 and 9. Then go down to Gilgal ahead of me, and I will join you there to sacrifice burnt offerings and peace offerings. And you must wait for seven days until I arrive and give you further instructions. As Saul turned and started to leave, God gave him a new heart, and Samuel's signs were fulfilled in him. 
that day. God wants to appoint people. He anoints people for purposes for his kingdom. The nation wanted a king, so God said, I'll give you a king. But he knew that king couldn't rule over them justly if he didn't have the anointing of God on him, if he didn't have the truth with him as they proceeded forward to lead a nation. And so Samuel anoints him as king. But many times when God has a call on your life, he's going to test you. And people like to think God doesn't test. He does test. He won't tempt you, but he will test you. You have to have the character that he wants you to have for the place that he's taking you. He will never set you up for failure. He wants to set you up for success. And he's testing your heart not because he doesn't know it. It's because you don't know it. We don't know our own heart. They're deceitful. Above all things, this heart is deceitful. We can think we're doing the right things for the right reasons and have the wrong motives. And God knows it. So he wants, to, he wants to expose Saul's heart. Do you have faith? Do you have trust? Will you listen? Will you obey the word of the Lord? And he was told to wait seven days. Don't you like that number? Perfection. Seven days. The perfect testing time. <laughs> seven days. And so we go jump to chapter 11 in Samuel. And that says that Samuel brings deliverance to the people. Or I'm Saul. Sorry. Saul brings deliverance to the people of Jabesh Gilead. At the end of the chapter, the people make Saul king. So there's a people in trouble. Saul hears about it. And because the spirit of the Lord is upon him, he gets angry. He's going to do something about this, that the people of God were being taunted in such a way from an enemy. And they had no hope. They had no one to turn to. And their cry went out to the Lord. And the Lord heard that cry. And he answered that cry through a man named Saul. He stirred his spirit within him to go out and do something about it. Sounds a little bit like our Jesus, doesn't it? He saw the people. They were like sheep without a shepherd, and he had compassion on them. And that compassion drove him to do things, to go out and serve and do, and it cost him when he did those things. It's no different for you and me. If we have the heart of God in us, then we're going to have compassion for those around us. We're going to put ourselves in places at times that's going to bring a cost to us. It's going to cost us something to serve them. It's going to cost us something to reach out and try to bring them to freedom. And times they're going to snap back and bite back because they don't understand but we know, and we want to see them come to freedom. And you have to be able to have some little bit of thick skin as a Christian as well. Realizing the things, like as, as the Lord had said, like they're not against you, Samuel. It's really me that they're turning against. And that's our society today. Right. We don't want to hear about this God that we have to submit to and bow down to. I will be my own God. And so they think life is good. Or is it? For you to know the story, it wasn't so good. And sometimes God will give you what you ask for. But it's not what he really wanted you to have. It's not the best. God wants you to have the best. It's the only way that we can have a good life. So they got what they asked for. They got a king. And then uh, Samuel chapter 12, the people realized that it wasn't wise to ask for a man to be king. So Samuel warns the people to follow the Lord, even though he's giving them this king. And in chapter 12, verses 24 and 25, it says, But be sure to fear the Lord and faithfully serve him. Think of all the wonderful things that he has done for you. But if you continue to sin, you and your king will be swept away. Me and my heart goes instantly to this country and where we've come from. What we had and had that was founded on faith in this God that we're talking about. And to turn away from that, to say, no, I want to be like the world. It brings devastation. And we're reaping the consequences of God being pushed away. We can, we can ha let that happen in our own lives if we're not careful. It only takes one, takes one act of disobedience to get us off of that path a little bit. And then one more act of disobedience. And our heart gets harder and harder as the Holy Spirit's trying to call us back. We go, nope, nope, I don't want to hear it. And it can come for all kinds of reasons. We can get hurt. We can get angry. We can get upset. And we can put up those walls. And when we put up those walls, we just, we're working with the enemy instead of against him. And in verse Samuel 13, Saul's given a test and fails. He's to wait for the prophet Samuel so the sacrifice can be made to the Lord. Fear of his circumstances moves him to disobedience. The enemy which he faces now seems too strong. Now he just had a victory over the Amalekites. God gave him a great victory. And in the next moment, he's facing a situation. He's going, oh my, the enemy's too big, too strong, too powerful. How many times do we get like that? Brings us out of a victory just to face another test. And then we're like, oh my, yeah. 
don't know what to do. Fear creeps up in us. What happens when fear comes? Then we tend to disobey because that fear takes over and takes control. But we know it says that perfect love casts out all fear. When you're close with your Savior, when you're hearing his voice, and you understand that he is greater than any opposition that we're going to face, that peace can reside in your heart, and you can continue to walk with him and not be disobedient to his word. So fear motivated him instead of faith, and he forgot the victory the Lord had just given him. We too can quickly forget the power which we experienced in our salvation. Let us never forget the victory in the Lord of our lives. Saul loses his kingship as fast as he received it. One act of disobedience brought such devastation. And we will witness how a heart can grow harder and harder and harder. You think this would have been enough for him to say, Oh, Lord, I was so wrong. Forgive me. But Saul didn't have that heart and he didn't have that attitude. And we're going to see how his heart got harder and harder to lead him further and further away from his anointing and his calling in his life. 1 Samuel 14 and goes on to say that Saul's son Jonathan moved in faith and God brings a great victory to the people. But Saul had made another dumb choice. And in 1 Samuel 14, verse 24, he says, Now the men of Israel were pressed to exhaustion that day because Saul had placed them under an oath saying, Let a curse fall on anyone who eats, eats before evening, before I have full revenge on my en enemies. So no one ate anything all day. Because the men were so hungry from the fight, they began to eat meat with blood still in it. And now they sin too. There's a great responsibility that comes with leadership. Leaders must choose their words wisely and allow God to lead them in making decisions. Our decisions affect others. Selfishness says I can do what I want. It doesn't matter. But when we have the heart of the Lord, we understand that we are connected. We are not alone. That God has connected us to other people. And it's not just family. It's the people in our society. And every choice that we make, even some of the simplest ones, still has an effect on other people. We don't understand the daisy chain effect that happens from one choice that we make further down the line in our lives and the lives of others. That's why it's so important to be in tune to the word of the Lord to you in any given moment. He's going to ask you to do some strange things sometimes. It doesn't make sense to the flesh and to the natural. But he understands the ramifications of that decision, whether you say yes or no. Right. Now, he knows what you're going to say, yes or no. And he'll make other provisions. But Sarah said something to me Sunday night that really hit me and stuck me. If, if, if you don't do it, God will raise up somebody else. Saul wasn't obedient, but God already had a plan because he knew he wasn't going to be obedient. He had another one that he was already raising up to take leadership. Do you want God to use someone else for what he's designed you to do? You'll never find fulfillment until you're walking in the plans of God for your life. But you can't let fear motivate you. You've got to trust in this word of the Lord. You've got to trust in the truth. And then we go on to 1 Samuel 15. Saul has a chance for redemption. God's a God of mercy. There's another test to his faith and obedience. Go wipe out the Amalekites completely. He, dis he disobeys again. Saving the king and the best of the animals, he did it his way. Not very wise. There's a way that seems right to man, it says in the word, but the end leads to destruction. So he was given a word, go destroy him, everything. Everything, animals, women, children, everything had to go because he knew if he left anything standing, the effect that it would have on his people, that that influence would creep in. There's things that God asks you to cut out of your life, gone. It has to go. Yeah. And we compromise. Yeah. And when we compromise, devastation comes into our lives. The next thing, we're angry at God because we find ourselves in circumstances that aren't pleasant. Mm -hmm. But it was our choice that took us there. So he's given a chance for redemption. He could have did the right thing this time. Yeah, he failed the last time, and we failed. But we don't have to fail every time. We need to learn from our mistakes and past sins. Look, you don't have to stay in that place. You can be obedient today. This, this word, you know, his mercies are new every day. Every day he's going to give you another chance to obey and walk with him and experience the power and presence of him in your life, that you can be an effective witness in this world for him. And so he doesn't obey again. He partially obeys. And in his mind, he goes, well, I obeyed everything that you told me. He told Samuel. He said, no, you didn't. Why do I hear the, the bleeding of sheep? You were to eliminate all that, God's orders. And he didn't. He goes, well, I brought the best back so that it could be sacrificed. And he says to you, your God. You notice the phrasing when you read that. It doesn't say my God. It says your God. You can see he's already getting further and further away from God. His heart's getting Harder and harder. So Samuel had to finish the deed of what 
he was supposed to. It says, now we get to the story within the story. And so far, it's been a little bit of a crazy ride. This is just one man, Saul. But we're going to see the effects of the decision of a nation, the decisions of a king, and then we're going to see what can happen when someone says, yes, Lord, and obeys completely. So now in 1 Samuel 16, verses 6 and 7, and when they arrived, Samuel took one look at El Eliab, thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way that you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Samuel's already on a mission. He's got the word from the Lord. I picked somebody else. I picked somebody that's going to be after my heart, that's going to listen to me. Saul didn't. He's done. Now I have another man. So he, he sends him to go look. And so as he's looking at, over this man's sons, the flesh says, well, I want the strongest, the tallest. I want the one with the most experience. God says, that's not who I'm looking for. And we go on to see in 1 Samuel 16, verse 13, it says, So David stood there among his brothers. Samuel took the flask of oil that he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Then Samuel returned to Ramah. The hard part of some of these journeys is that from the time of the anointing, sometimes to the time of your actual placement, there can be some distance in time. And those seasons are hard, but they're testing seasons. Again, the Lord's training you. He's working on your heart. He's working on your obedience. He wants you to be successful in the place where he's getting ready to plant you. And so he anoints David, but it's going to be a while till he ever becomes king. And we're not going to go that far today, but we're going to see because of this anointing and because of his heart for God, that he was able to do something greater than Saul. He was able to bring some people to freedom because of his obedience, not the trust in himself, but the trust in his God. And we're at a time and place in our nation. You've got to have your trust in God. It can't be in anything else. Everything else will fail you, disappoint you, and maybe even hurt you. Your faith has to be in God himself and where he's taking you, where he's taking his church in this world. We have to be strong. We have to have confidence in the word that he gives us. We have to have confidence in the Bible. And if we waver from that, if we, if we compromise, there's not going to be success. Don't, don't, don't let yourself be fooled thinking that you're going to be able to be disobedient to his word, whether it's you individually, whether it's this church, whether it's his church. It's not. There's no success in compromise. You may not realize that God was doing in the moment. And if you're following him, he's taking you to where he needs you to be. God is wise and knows exactly the time and place which you need to be. God de develops character before giving you authority. God continues to groom David for his future. He was working in David long before his anointing. David begins to serve Saul in his court, bringing comfort to Saul by playing music. Doesn't seem like the work of a king, does it? Or maybe is it? Not only is David serving the king, but he's still serving his father by taking care of his father's sheep. Can you see what's necessary to become a good leader? Right. Servant's heart, right? A humble heart. And that's what David had. Then David's father sends him to his brothers with food uh, to come back with a report about their well-being because they're serving in the military. And can you see how God's lining things up in David's life? From tending his father's sheep to being a servant to his father, being obedient to him. The father sends him to go see how his brothers are doing in the war, sends him with food. He obeys his father. You know, there's a thing about children obeying their parents that's important to God. And now we're adults in here, the kids are out, but, you know, if we don't obey our parents and we get out in that world, all of a sudden we don't have much respect for authorities out there either, do we? It's God's wise. He's very wise in the structures that he's set up in the home and in the family and in the Christian community. He has set levels of authority, so to speak, and we're to honor those things because he knows that that brings us to success. And so he was working in David's life, preparing him for his kingship that was to come yet, yeah, still out in the future. 1 Samuel 17, verses 1 through 11. The Philistines now mustered their army for battle and camped between uh, Sokoth and Judah and Ezekah and Ephes, Damon, Saul, countered by gathering his Israelite troops near the valley of Elah. So between them, then Goliath the Philistine, a champion from Gath, 
came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall, wore a bronze helmet, bronze coat of mail that weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leg armor and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. His armor bearer walked ahead of him, carrying a shield. Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight? He called. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. And when Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. I want you to paint this scene in your heads. A valley between these two armies on hilltops looking across at each other. And here comes this giant out, just spewing out all these things against the army of Israel, God's army, God's people. Here's an army that had just been in battles before that had victories. They were trained men. They were armed men. They, this is what they were prepared for. And yet, because of a man's disobedience, they cowered in fear. It's not what God wants for us. We have nothing to fear except Him, to have a holy and reverent fear in all of Him. And when you have that, you will desire to obey what He calls you to do. So they're, they're cowering. He's putting these taunts out there. Day after day, He does this. And then we're going to see what happens. So why did He no longer stand in defense of the one God loved, Israel. Why, why is Saul cowering back? Remember that he lost his anointing because of disobedience. The once victorious one now has no valor. God has raised up another who is anointed and has no fear because of his God. 1 Samuel 17, 32. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When a lion or bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too. For he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescues me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet, and a coat of mail. David put it on and strapped the sword over it and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. Sometimes I'm even guilty of looking around, <laughs> looking at other Christians, looking at their strengths, yeah. looking at what God has them do. Here Saul's trying to put his armor on David. David said, I can't wear this. This isn't what I was equipped for. It fits you, but it doesn't fit me. Let's be careful trying to push each other into molds. Let's, let's see what God's doing in each other's lives and encourage that out of each other. But God is equipping you differently than he's equipping me. But he's going to equip us all if we'll let him. And so he puts off his armor. And don't try to do God's work with someone else's armor. It's not going to work for you. What he has given to you is sufficient for the task he has given you. Trust what the Lord has given you. This goes back to trust. Trusting his word. Trusting the truth. What he wants to work through your life, he is preparing you for. He's not going to let you fail. He's not going to let you suffer. Trust in him. Just as the lion and the bear was with David, God has brought you through past trials and difficulties so you can face the one that's before you with even more confidence. We are victorious because Christ is victorious. Amen. Yeah. Many times, you know, the next battle looks different than the last battle. But in God's eyes, it's no different. There's still victory. And so you want to fight from a place of victory because you'll react differently. You'll act differently. You'll do differently because you have the confidence, not in you, 
but in your God that has equipped you. It's a big difference, big, big difference. And in verse 40, it says he picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them into his shepherd's bag. Then armed with only his shepherd's staff and a sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. You know, there's places in your life that if other people seen them, they would think there's nothing there for you. They're dry desert places. Even sometimes when we're in those places, we're like, oh my, how am I going to survive in this place? There is nothing here for me. However, it says in one version that from the wadi, he picked up these stones. A dry place. Sometimes it had water, but for the most part, it was dry. Something that seemed so insignificant to someone, a stone for a battle against a warrior who has a a sword and a spear and a shield and an armor bearer. But because he knew his God, he was willing to take the risk. What are you willing to risk for God today? What's he asking of you? What's he asking you to do? And I know it's bigger than you because if it's not bigger than you, it's probably not God. Yeah. And it's the, it's the enemy whispering because he wants you to get prideful. Look at what I've done. I worked so hard. I did this. I studied so much. No, no. It's because of what God gives you, the strength that he gives you. So he has these five stones. And he replies to the Philistine in verse 45. You come to me with sword, spear, and javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head. And at this I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Does the world know that God is in your life and working? Can they see it? Is there a fear from the enemy? Is he looking at you going, wow, I'm going to have to do something about this one? There should be. There should be if you're willing to let God use you the way that he wants to use you. Do you get upset of what's happening in the world? The mockery that's being made of marriages. The mockery that's being made of the, the things that God destined for his people to be successful to have joy and peace and righteousness in their lives. And the world just mocks it all. It should anger you in your spirit, not to just go, wow, do you see what they're doing? Do you see what they're saying? Is your feet moving? Is your mouth opening? Are we doing something about what's going on in our society? He's given such great power to the church and to his people. He's given us a truth that conquers. He's given us a love that conquers. It's powerful. But you have to move. You have to open your mouth. We're called to proclaim this truth. We are his hands and feet. I still don't know why he's chosen that. That's what he has chosen, to work through us. That was his plan from the beginning. It's still his plan now. And he will accomplish all that he has set out to do with you or without you. And I pray that it's with you. I pray that it's with me. I want to be used of God for his kingdom. I want to see him glorified. I want to see his name elevated and worshiped in our land again. And everyone assembled there in verse 47. Here we'll know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with a sword and a spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give it to us. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in and Goliath stumbled and fell down, face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Then David ran over and pulled Goliath's swords out of his sheath, and David used it to kill him and cut off his head. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead. They turned and ran. This army, once so confident in their giant, realized the power of God. They seen it for themselves right before their eyes, and it put fear in their hearts. But what brings fear to the world can bring faith to God's people. That day, David knew the truth of his God and what he was able to do because he'd experienced it in his past with with the bear and the lion. And Goliath met that truth head on. There's a pun in there intended. (laughs) As, As that truth hit him between the eyes. God gave David a promotion that day. But still, he's not king yet. David's training's not over. He will continue to serve in new ways that help him to be equipped to be king. 
The foundation from which we live is of most importance. Truth is that foundation. We are not to cower back from the world shouting insults about the things of our God and his kingdom. Will you stand up and confront the lies in the world that come from the father of lies? The truth will always prevail and deceit is exposed in the light of truth. Mm -hmm. I know sometimes the darkness looks pretty dark, but the promise is the light is more powerful than the darkness. When the light steps in, when the light shows up, the darkness has to flee. Amen. And you are that light. If you are a born again believer, you have the spirit of God in you, you are the light. You are the salt of this earth. So my heart today is for us as individuals, you know, be open to the light. Let God shine it in. Is there any area in our hearts and our minds where we're deceived in any way? Let the light illuminate that, whether it's about you, who you are as a child of God. Many people struggle with those lies of who you are and who you're not. You have to take the truth of God's word, and it has to become part of who you are, that you know your identity in Christ Jesus. The Father loves you, that he set out from the beginning of time to rescue you and me. The cross demonstrates that, the extent which he is willing to go to bring us back into relationship with him. Maybe it's about your family, your kids, your spouses. You know, the, the enemy loves shooting those flaming arrows into our minds about them, what they're doing, what they're not doing, what they should do, all the blah, blah, blah. Make sure you know the truth. The truth is that we don't know another person's heart. And if we think we do, we're already deceived. You know, people do different things for different reasons. They say things for different reasons. And we have to be on guard of the things that come out of our mouths. And we want it to be truth, the truth of the word of God. Not only about who our God is, but about who they are. Even the people that are unbelieving at this moment, the truth is God loves them and wants them in his kingdom. His heart is he wishes for none to perish, but for all to come to repentance. They were created in his image too. That's the truth. And so when we go at war against people, we're already on the wrong side. There are spirits behind those things that we can war against, but not people themselves. He says to love them to pour into them, that the goodness that he has, that he wants to work through you will draw them to repentance. Yep. This is what God does. This is the truth of God's word. The truth will always prevail. We must completely trust Jesus who is the truth and take our position in battle. With the truth in hand, we're ready and able to bring victory to those who do not know the truth. Trust the one who has been working in you long before you came to the front lines. Before you were ever saved, God knew the plans that he had for you. Even the circumstances you, you thought God could never use, he was aware of. And he will turn those things and use those for good in your life and for his glory. Mm -hmm. Trust the one who has been working in you long before. He has not set you up for failure, but for fearlessness. Take his truth today and send it forth in your life. Trust what the truth will do and the freedom that is available to all who will believe it. Let us guard our hearts from pride so that we do not disobey our God. It's a quick trip from being a conqueror to a coward. We know in our world there's many that had followed Jesus that had fallen away. Somewhere along the line, the truth was no longer relevant in their lives. The lie became greater than the truth. The darkness became greater than the light. And they pushed God aside like Saul did. It doesn't end up well. But God is a merciful and graceful God. Amen. And to those that will obey... And we know David's life. If you've read his story, he wasn't a perfect man. He had his failings. There's moments he disobeyed. But his heart was different than Saul's, just like it was with, um, between uh, Peter and Judas. You know, similar, they both, both ran away from Jesus. They both denied him in their own ways. But Peter's heart was soft. It was repentant. Saul's heart was hard. David's heart, when he failed, it was repentant. He realized the wrong that he had done, and he came back into agreement with God. You can disagree with God. He's given you that right, that ability, that free will, but it doesn't make you right. God's truth is always truth, always. Nothing changes that fact. And I want to come back again to the Revelation 21. Verse 7 it says that he who overcomes the world by adhering faithfully to Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior, will inherit these things. And I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowards and the unbelieving, it doesn't end well. 
Will you join me in asking God today for boldness? The boldness of a lion that we can stand and proclaim the truth that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the risen one. He is the eternal one. He is the only way to come into a relationship with God. He is the only one that dealt with our sins. No other God, no other person, him alone. That's the truth. We have that truth to carry out to the world. That truth sets us free. It sets us free from being selfish. It sets us free from making decisions that we don't care how it affects other people. We're mindful of the people around us. We sacrifice self for the greater good because that's the example that our Jesus gave us. He was willing to lay down his life that we might live, that we might have freedom. He gave up his glory to walk in this earth, to become like man. It says that he, he knows all the struggles that we have, and yet he was without sin. He paid the price that wasn't his to pay. That's hard. Are you willing to pay the price for someone that doesn't deserve it? To love that person that's not too lovable in your eyes? The one that maybe you think they went too far from the grace of God, that they're not worthy of his salvation. And I hope that's never the case with us, that we realize that we all need Jesus. Yeah. That is also truth. So as we get ready to close the challenge, I guess, not even a challenge, I think it's more of a request before the Lord. This work that you have to do as a child of God in his kingdom, as a warrior for him and for truth, he's not asking you to do it alone. He's asking you to receive the power that he wants to give you to do that. Just as David was anointed and the power of the Lord came upon him, he had a boldness that he wouldn't have had if God hadn't done that. God wants to do that in our lives as his people. It's a promise, matter of fact, that he will give us his spirit so that we can be bold witnesses for him. Yes. Being a bold witness means that you're going to stand for truth in your own life personally. You're going to do that in your family. You're going to do that in your community. You're going to do that in our nation. You're going to do that in this world. Yes. That comes with the potential for great opposition. And it might cost you. It might cost you a lot. Jesus did that for us. He gave us that example. He laid down his life. Are we willing to lay down our life for him? We have to die for the Lord, right? Because it's supposed to be no longer me that lives, <laughs> but Christ that lives in me. He wants to live through us. And to do that, we have to get rid of Self, and he helps us with that. And so he'll give us his spirit. And we're going to look at one last uh, set of scripture. Acts 4, 25 through 31. You spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit through our ancestors, David. Your servant saying, why were the nations so angry? Why did they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepared for battle. The rulers gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. In fact, this happened here in this very city. For Herod Antipas, Pontius Pilate, and the governor, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were all united against Jesus, your holy servant, whom you anointed. But everything they did was determined beforehand according to your will. And now, O oh Lord, hear their threats and give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After this prayer, the meeting place shook, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. Boldness. No fear. No fear what someone's going to think of you because you're trying to tell them about their eternal salvation. Don't back down from the enemy when he gets in your face, when he's coming after you, when he's coming after your family. He's not bigger than you. Amen. He's not bigger than your God that's in you. Stand in your place. And as a church, as a whole, as his people, we need to stand in this time for what is right and true and holy and noble. Who else is going to do it? Who else? The church. Man, we've got a call as a church upon our lives. We've got the power of God working in us and through us. Yes. Why do we cower? 
Let's make sure our hearts are good. Let's make sure we've been obedient to what he's put on our hearts, that we've stepped out in faith, that we're not cowering back. Let's stop making it about us. I'm pretty good at that. Lord asked me to do something. Yeah, Lord, but. And then I got the list of why he can't do that through me and use me. Let's stop. He will do it. He will show himself true. He will show himself to the watching world as the triumphant God, the victorious God, the all-powerful God, the creator God, the one that we've come to know. Don't let the enemy have it. What doesn't belong to him? Let's, Let's get the people back. Let's rescue them. Because of David's faithfulness and stepping out and facing the giant, Israel then got encouraged. The army finally got the courage to go after the enemy because of one person's faithfulness. You have no idea by your faith what can be accomplished. There's generations coming behind us we're not going to get to see. But God knows them already. And he has a work for you to do that's going to affect them. There was a work that was done before our time of faithful people that walked with the Lord, that were obedient to him, that gave the truth, that came to us somewhere we heard the gospel. Thank God for that. Thank God for their lives and their sacrifice. Many of those sacrifices we don't always get to hear about. Many people suffered to bring that gospel to us. Now it's our turn. It's our season. It's our time. We stand for what is right and true today in this nation. Up front here, um, where's Faye? Is she in here? There's some rocks up here that someone had done for me. One side, side says Jesus, and the other side says trust. In the face of what's going on maybe in your life right now, a little rock don't seem sufficient for what you're facing. Maybe as you look across your family and you see the devastation that's happening with relationships being torn apart, a little rock don't seem like it could do much. If you look at our nation, the turmoil that's taking place even right now that's happening and you think a little rock what, what, what can a rock do in this time but if that rock is Jesus it can do everything are you willing to carry truth with you are you willing to use truth against the enemy not people not people but the enemy and the lies that might be in their hearts and in their minds That truth can set them free. And it's not fair for us to know it, to have it, and experience it, and not offer it to someone else. It's not right. It's not right at all. Freely, you've been given. Freely, give. It's not ours to give away. It's easy to give away somebody else's stuff. That's always asking us to do. Give it away. You've experienced the love of Christ in your life. You felt the freedom, the, the lifting of the burden of sin that was on your life when you came to Jesus. And if you haven't experienced that, you can experience that today. The sins that so easily entangle and pull us down. The pits that it pulls us into where there's no hope of a better future or tomorrow. And we're fearing the judgment of God upon our lives because it will be one day. For all the things that are on that list, there's a judgment for all those things. But we can stand free of that judgment. And we can stand in His grace. We can stand in His purpose. And you'll never never find anything else that will satisfy you other than Jesus. 